back with another banger for you guys today and as you can see by the title man we have a uh five nights at freddy's type of video and i know that you guys loved five nights at freddy's overall in general with the sml content that we reacted to in the past and uh this really caught my attention because it's five nights at freddy's kill count so it's literally we're going to be going through the kill count of the movie which i did end up watching finally um by the way after i reacted to all the five nights at freddy's uh videos that sml had dropped i went ahead and i watched five nights at freddy's and uh, i i ain't gonna lie i did not know that it was really like a horror movie for real so i know you guys are big fans of this and i was like why not react to this and, the, and see the kill count that actually happened in the movie if you guys enjoy this type of content please let me know in the comment section down below before we dive into this if you guys like to follow me on my gaming channel the link for that will be in the description down below i have been posting content over there consistently and you guys have been showing major love and i appreciate all the support i've been receiving also make sure you guys are subscribed to this channel with notifications turned on that way you do not miss any of the uploads of course and we're gonna dive right into the five nights at freddy's kill count let's get it Today we're looking at Five Nights at Freddy's, okay. at least in 2023. Five Nights at Freddy's, or FNAF to fans, is based on the FNAF, viral video okay. game franchise of the same name. FNAF takes place at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, a Chuck E. Cheese style restaurant plagued by animatronic animosity. It's hard to know where to start with FNAF. <laughs> released in 2014, the indie horror game Five Nights at Freddy's was created in just six months by a single man, Scott Cawthon, who at that point was developing family-friendly Christian adventure games. One Interesting. of his efforts, Chipper and Sons Lumber Co., was criticized for its unintentionally creepy characters. So Cawthon decided to repurpose the <laughs> Oh, okay. I can, I can low-key see the inspiration in the animatrons from just the little characters on these games that this guy was creating. Five Nights quickly wow. blossomed into a full-on media franchise, currently consisting of nine main games, multiple spin-off games, novels, comics, an ass load of merchandise, and a haunted <laughs> house in Las Vegas? What? FNAF's success is due in part to its complicated lore, which has been picked apart and analyzed by countless internet sleuths. With such a <laughs> rabid fan base, a film adaptation was all but inevitable. But it languished in development hell for many years, going back What's to What's crazy is that this Plum horror House movie attracted the, the kids. Project in October 2023. It's like a, it it's a almost like a honey Chuck E. Cheese. You know what I mean? Like, what the hell? Mobile <laughs> on Peacock opening day, it grossed nearly $300 million worldwide. I'm gonna watch it again I tonight. never got into Five Nights, but I was happy to see this movie's success. I think the acting is solid and that it's shot well, thanks to the cast and the direction by Emma Tammy. And the animatronics created by the geniuses at the Jim Henson Creature Shop are absolutely incredible. They look like they were ripped straight out of the games. But I've only played the first game a couple of times, and if you don't know the lore, this movie is confusing and honestly pretty slow. As a film, I found it kind of mid. But the truth is, it doesn't fucking matter what I think. This <laughs> thing was made for the fans, and by all accounts, those fans seem to love it, so I'm thrilled for them. I knew we needed to make a movie that was going to land with the fans, and that was Jason Blum's priority and, and Scott's as well. I mean, if this gets kids excited to watch scenes of people talking and kick ass practical animatronics, then yes, make a million more, please. Especially since it doesn't dumb things down for its younger audience. Even though it's not overly complicated. Oh my it's gosh. Got foreshadowing and themes and good lighting. It's a fine little movie. And I'm happy that it made so many people happy. Will our characters survive their five nights with Freddy, or will they punch out early from to the To be fair, show? I don't think the only the only person that really actually truly has survived five nights at Freddy's that I know of is Jeffy. That's because he stood on business and beat the shit out of uh Freddy. I'm pretty sure I, th I, re I think it was Freddy that he beat the shit out of. If I remember correctly, <laughs> when, it, when it when it was in the kills. SML video. <laughs> Jeffy stood on business, say Brooklyn guy. Chucky Chase. A security guard is crawling and walking his way through Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, because he's done with the monitor monitoring and whatever's on the other side of that door. Ooh, I think it's something foxy. <laughs> this dumb dumb cannot run those dumb yeah, yeah, so remember this part. <laughs> strapped down. He's about to be put in an animatronic suit, and you know what they say about those masks. So you can imagine how having your head forcefully pressed inside one of those could cause a bit of discomfort. And death. The guard is killed when the mask gives him an off-screen Fazbear facial. <laughs> what to you? 8-bit opening credits pay homage to the so that was one games featured in several of the FNAF sequels. They show someone suited up as a yellow bunny, wonder who, peeling kids off from their friends one by one. Where are you taking them, bunny? Where's the sprite string? Mike Schmidt is also a security guard, only he works at the local mall. That is, until he witnesses what seems to be a kidnapping, which causes him to hulk out and baptize the guy with a beatdown. <laughs> Unfortunately, he misread the situation. <laughs> 
Come on, Mike, what the fuck was that? That was a mistake. Yeah, it was. Now you've got Shaggy yelling at you. He's fired <laughs> and has a meeting with the crew. No, oh, yeah, that is Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, bro. That shit crazy. Steve Raglan? Yeah, okay, doubt. Steve, Zoinks. totally his real name, is played by Matthew Lillard, a two-time Kill Count veteran and one-time Prime Rib presenter. Thanks again for that, man. Steve is initially dismissive since Schmidt is a shit employee, but for some reason, his tune changes after seeing Mike's last name. I have a job for you. Maybe you noticed that Mike is named after the first game's protagonist. He offers Mike a security shift at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. You only have to worry about one thing. The killer animatronics. Keeping people out. Oh, I could have sworn it was the killer animatronics. <laughs> Steve sells the job as a real winner. How's the pay? Not great, but the hours are worse. Those hours are the graveyard shift, which Mike says he can't work. He needs to prioritize his nightly routine, which consists of pills, posters, and nature sounds. All this ambience is to help him lucidly dream about a childhood camping trip. He was supposed to be watching over his little brother Garrett, but got distracted and didn't notice when Garrett went off with a stranger. Not even aging into PETA is enough for Mike to change the past, and his dream always ends with Garrett's abduction. But he thinks that by visiting the incident in his dreams, he might remember a clue he's forgotten and finally find out what's happened to his bro. Mike is now the guardian of his little sister Abby, who likes dinosaurs and building tents. They have an Aunt Jane who thinks Mike shouldn't be watching over the young yin, even though he's a well-meaning guy. I mean, besides the whole assaulting a dad thing. <laughs> but crying kid, he was doing it because he cares. The shopping mall and gives Aunt Jane an in to claim Abby for herself, hoping to collect them foster child funds. She intends on taking sole custody of Abby with the help of her fearsome lawyer, Doug. Tremble before him! <laughs> Knowing that he'll need to look good in front Man, of the didn't judge, even say a Mike word, just sitting there chilling. Raglan to take him up on his job offer. We're less than 20 minutes into this thing and we're already at Freddy's. I love how we ain't fazzy footing around. Mike's first night begins with a phone call from Steve, giving him the lowdown. This place was huge in the 80s with the kids. Steve's phone call is in the style of phone guy, your supervisor in the games who provides you with instructions via voicemail. Oh. Oh, oh. This place's security system is dated but extensive, with cameras and lights everywhere, except probably right outside the office. And of course, since this is FNAF, the power situation ain't great. The electricity is a bit iffy. Mike I would never work at office, any place where it's dark all the time, to be the honest. The game, complete with a fan, I don't care what, drink, what, ball of tin what the pavement no, was, none of that. Like, I'm not chilling in the, the, nose in the dark on that by myself, bro. So remember, Production designer Mark Vicicella added tons of set deck easter eggs, including a prize counter filled with the second game's fun time animatronics, and a nod to Chica's Magic Rainbow, the main antagonist of FNAF World, a spin-off RPG. <laughs> Freddy's uses the jigsaw employee training technique, so Mike pops his tape in and watches a retro training video. <laughs> the video covers the Disneyland level tech that goes into Fazbear's animatronics, but right when it's turning into a how it's made on dancing robots, the tape gets spooky, so Mike doesn't fully see them in action. All he knows is that he must protect this proprietary technology, a job duty that doubles as a tongue twister. FNAF's dedication to its source material was guided by the game's creator, Scott Cawthon. He co-produced the movie and helped keep the lore and animatronic design true to the IP. He also wrote the initial draft of the screenplay, which director Emma Tammy and co-writer Seth Cudback then expanded on to flesh out the characters and story. Instead of doing his job, Mike keeps up his nightly routine of trauma dreaming. It's the same old, same old until Mike stumbles upon five Having the experience like that, tries to pry them like losing your little brother like that, definitely you would haunt brother, you forever. Their response is less than helpful. Mike wakes up and ends his shift when the clock strikes six o'clock. <laughs> he returns home to relieve his babysitter, Max, not knowing that she's been working with Aunt Jane to collect evidence against Mike. She and her brother, Jeff, meet with Jane at a diner where they're waited on by YouTuber MadPat. You do realize that lunch is the most important meal of the day. I thought it was breakfast. Some people say that, but you know, it's just a theory. It's a well-deserved cameo, seeing as his game theory videos helped kick off FNAF's explosive success. In fact, Matt Pat's cameo was the very first scene filmed for the movie. Matt's not the only FNAF creator featured in the film. The employee of the month wall in the background includes several streamers like 8-Bit Ryan, Razbowski, Baz, Fusion Z Gamer, and Daco. Markiplier was also asked to appear as the security guard who bites it in the opening sequence, but he had to turn it down to work on his own upcoming horror film, Iron Lung. Max can't find any Iron Lung, I've heard of that doing, before. So Jane pays them to fuck with Mike's employment by trashing the pizzeria. Then he'll get fired and she can take custody. It's the perfect illegal plan. I just realized I shouldn't be hearing any of this. On his second <laughs> night, Mike gets right back to sleep manifesting. What kind of lawyer, job. bro? But the little dream warriors <laughs> run away again. One little pirate even gives him the hook and a scare bear stare. Mike wakes up to see a police officer at the door trying to buzz her way inside. About time. 
starting to think maybe you fell asleep on the job. What? Who, me? Never. This is Vanessa, a local cop who seems to know more Little about baddie. friends than she's letting on. She sees that Mike has a cut on his arm, the same one that he got in his dream. But this Five Nights at Freddy Krueger shit never comes up again. What the fuck's that all about? She gives Mike the grand tour of the restaurant, including a performance by its robo band. The song they sing is Talking in Your Sleep by The Romantics, an earwormy reference to Mike's sleeping habits. It plays several times in the film, which is great. I love when movies have a signature needle drop, like in Your Next, Us, and The Lost Boys. I remember the seeing Your Next, so I've seen that shit. From the original game. Guitarist Bonnie, a blue bunny. I feel like, I feel like Five Nights at Freddy's is the only Chica, horror movie Backup kids can really watch. A sidekick named Mr. Cupcake, party pirate Foxy, who I guess is just there for, uh, I don't know, vibes? And the band leader, Freddy Fazbear himself. Tammy knew from the get-go the animatronics would be the focal point of the film. They are part of the cast sure. and the characters that the fans are the most familiar with actually right. going into this film. The difficult task of bringing them to life went to the team at Jim Henson's Creature Shop, under the supervision of lead designer Robert Bennett. The team created full-sized animatronics of the mascots, as well as suits worn by stunt performers. Jade Kindar Martin played Bonnie, Jess Weiss played Chica, and Kevin Foster played Freddy. Foster's actually been added to the kill count before in Jurassic World. It wasn't easy for them to perform in these heavy suits. I have a helmet that's about 16 pounds, and I call it a helmet because it's full. I'm in there, and I don't really have any visibility whatsoever. Occasionally, puppeteers had to step in to operate their arms and hands, while additional performers controlled the eyes, ears, and mouth off screen. Even though this jam session rocks, things aren't all fun and games at the pizzeria. Vanessa mentions that some kids went missing there in the 80s, which grabs Mike's attention since missing kids is kind of his whole thing. But she drives off before they can unravel that thread, leaving Mike to lock up for the day. He's spied on by Max's brother Jeff, who initiates Operation Fuck Up Fast. <laughs> he and his gang of ruffians break into the pizzeria and promptly start causing all sorts of trouble. Ah, shit. How do you wind up with this group of people? Like, how do they know this? This worst thing start getting out of control. Is poking through the kitchen when he's jump scared by Chica, who promptly sicks Mr. Cupcake on him. His buddy yep. Hank hears the commotion and discovers Carl getting his face. <laughs> that was number two. Oh my Austin. god. Mm. Jeff is hanging out in the security room when he sees Hank on the monitor screaming like a maniac. Hank tries to hide, but winds up locking himself in with Bonnie, who reduces him to a bloody version of the Titanic. <laughs> There's three. Engine. Jeff arrives just in time to see Boogie Bunny Bonnie emerging from the closet. He runs away and holes up in the security room, where he narrowly avoids a sneak attack by Mr. Cupcake. In the games, Mr. Cupcake is basically a static prop, but he's promoted to full-on killer robot status in the movie. Director Tammy admitted production was a little obsessed with Cupcake, who was able to be incorporated into more scenes due to his small size. Jeff tries to escape, but is foiled by a locked door. Sucks for him, since the scat man's on his way again. <laughs> The Dum Dums come courtesy of Foxy, who hums a similar ditty in the original game. <laughs> he runs down the hallway and puts an end to Jeff with another move cribbed from his in-game behavior. We know how fast Foxy is, bro. <laughs> <laughs> While the other characters could be played by humans, Foxy was a full animatronic puppet who required six performers just to make him walk. We have one on the head, one on the face, one on the arms. We have two on the feet, and then we have one that runs the rig, which pushes up and down and allows Foxy to sort of tilt forward and move his body up and down. This fricky fricky Fox was a danger off screen too. At one point, an overheating servo nearly lit him on fire. Someone on my team said, Foxy's smoking. I was like, yeah, Foxy's smoking. And, I, and they're like, no, no, it's smoking. And I look back and I'm like, oh, it's smoking. Max, who's been waiting in the getaway car, goes inside to see what's taking so long. She encounters a little boy who runs away telling her to follow him, sounding exactly like an NPC. Follow me. A set this size would typically be built in parts, but production built Fazbear's Pizza as one continuous location, allowing the actors to move between rooms like it were an actual building. Max winds up in a workshop full of broken toys. One of the animatronics there is Sparky the Dog, a supposedly hidden character in the first game. The diner from earlier was named after him. Sparky turned out to be just an internet urban legend though, I guess Gen Z's version of the Mew under the truck by the SS Ann. Max follows the boy's voice to a Freddy suit in the corner and abandons any and all sense of logic when she sticks her face straight in its maw. She's pulled inside and literally bites the dust. <laughs> was that the bite of 87? No, no, I, five. I, I know it wasn't. So please don't yell at me in the comments. But please don't yell at me in the comments. We're at five Vanessa right now, five Mike nights at Freddy's. Of the damage done by Jeff and his crew. She accuses him of being too drugged up for the job, having found his stash of sleepy pills. So he opens up about his traumatic childhood and why he spends so much time sleeping. Every single thing that you see your entire lifetime, the tiniest of details gets 
stored inside of you. I mean, no, that is not how the brain works, but Mike believes it is, which is why he keeps searching his dream memories for clues. He also reveals his father abandoned him and Abby after their mother died, who I guess is enough of a character to add to the count. I, honestly, I don't even know my own rules sometimes. <laughs> Vanessa is played by Elizabeth Lale. We're gonna stick with five, guys. We're gonna stick with five, because five have died by the animal tribes. TikTok fan camps. His horror credits include slashers like Detention and Tragedy Girls, the latter of which was penned by Tyler McIntyre and Chris Lee Hill, who have story by credits on FNAF alongside game creator Scott Cawthon. In light of his tragic backstory, Vanessa agrees not to file a police report, but insists that Mike stay awake and alert when he's working around the animatronics. With his usual babysitter bitten and high off, Mike is forced to bring Abby along on his next shift. She's gonna have to sleep on the floor, but she's still excited because there's Having nothing to bring your kids little love sister more to, than a cleaning to, to this yeah. job is crazy. I love watching dudes clean restaurants in my horror movies. All that cleaning gets Mike tuckered out, so he, you guessed it, takes another nap on the clock. He grills his new dream friend for info. Help me remember the man who took my brother. But the kid ghosts him, leaving behind a dirt bunny for Mike to ponder. Hmm. While he's sleeping, Abby gets up to poke around for more lively playmates. <laughs> she screams and wakes Mike up, who finds her surrounded by Fazbear. Ah, he's shit. ready to go to chair town to take this bear down, but don't worry, Mikey. Abby's just having some wholesome fun. They won't stop tickling me. This rock band just wants to play. <laughs> Wink. And though they don't like Mike, they're held at bay by Abby and her cutesy doodles. Mike realizes Abby's most recent illustrations look like a page out of his dream journal. Them's those damn dream kids he keeps saying. Turns out Abby's been getting drawing prompts from beyond the veil. All they talk about is a yellow rabbit. Mike takes Abby back to Freddy's the next night so she can probe her new friends for more details about Garrett's kidnapping. When they get there, they find Vanessa admiring Abby's artwork. Mike pulls her aside to ask her what the fuck the animatronics are. Ghost children possessing giant robots? Oh, uh, actually sounds like he picked up on it pretty quickly. So it seems like the ghost kids from his dreams are the ones kidnapped in the 80s, with each of them representing a robo band member. An Abbey original kicks off a goofy fort building montage set to connection by Elastica. I can't say I expected this cheesy ass sequence, but you know what? I still find it kind of cute. But, oh man, did they really want to lay on that nasty ass carpet? You know it's full of dirt and gum and pee, probably. Despite the hijinks, Fazbear's Pizza is far from kid friendly, if this dolly death trap is anything to go off of. Some fans think this peepless creeper is Circus Baby, a recurring enemy in the game. Yeah, that However, motherfucker look crazy. to be more closely based on <laughs> Ella, a character from the FNAF novels. It's a pretty obscure character to be sure, though still relevant enough to get her own Funko Pop. <laughs> By the way, thank I, you, they, of course they have a Funko Pop of her too. Information. <laughs> like I said, earlier, I don't know jack shit about this series. Vanessa explains that Fazbear's older animatronics were also worn as suits. These pokey prongs, called spring locks, were designed to keep the suit's robo bits in place. Unfortunately, they tend to get a little more bear trappy as they age. If that wasn't scary enough, Abby shreds too hard and knocks herself unconscious. Vanessa gets mad that Mike endangered his sister by bringing her here, but I mean, you know, it doesn't mean they can't still hook up, right? If you ever bring Abby back here again, I will shoot you. So that's... So maybe? She's standing the on of business. convince Mike he's an unfit guardian. Abby wakes up the next morning to the smell of burnt bacon and bad news. Mike's gonna let Aunt Jane take custody of her after all. Aw, oh, Abby, I know it sucks. Just channel that anger into your heart. Mike runs away from his responsibilities and back to Freddy's to take a nap. This time in his dreams, Garrett is conspicuously unkidnapped. The Boo Crew shows up and offers Mike a deal. He can have a nightly reunion with his loving family, all at the low, low price of his little sister. We want Abby. A conflicted Mike agrees to the deal, but thinks about it for like two more seconds and regrets it immediately. Sucks for him though, cause now the kids are gone and so is the family he traded for, what the fuck? Mike wakes up and finds himself strapped in the same perilous position as his predecessor. He manages to free himself and stumbles upon the bodies of Max and her friends who have been stuffed into various Fazbear brand suits. Max appears to be stuffed inside Shadow Freddy, a purple variant of Freddy, ooh. Mike makes it to the back entrance where he nearly falls victim to Foxy's song and dance before escaping. I love this cable system they used for Foxy's sprint down the hallway, it's great. Back home, Aunt Jane is too distracted by her nightly in infomercials to notice she has a surprise guest. Hmm. Abby emerges from her room to find Freddy and Lead Ghost Kid waiting for her. She'll just have to ignore Aunt Jane lying on the floor over there. <laughs> Lead Kid tells Abby That's she's six. sleeping, and it's possible she's only knocked out, but I'm making a judgment call and saying she did. <laughs> to get to Fazbear's, Abby and Freddy take a cab driven by streamer Cory X Kenshin. Cory's played these games a lot before, so he agrees to take the Freddy Fazfair. Why do I always get the weirdos? 
You might notice that this Freddy is more fast beaten up compared to his appearance at the restaurant. That's because this isn't Freddy. Lead Ghost Kid even said so. Not Freddy. It's actually Golden Freddy, a ghostly entity who serves so they as have the several versions antagonist of, Freddy. of the first okay. game. Fans of the games might have caught his iconic It's Me written on a mirror earlier, or noticed his signature glowing right eye. He's who the Lead Ghost Kid represents, but he phantom vanishes once they arrive at the restaurant. We catch up with Mike at a random police supply outpost that Vanessa must have brought him to off screen. He's pissed at her for not warning him about the homicidal robots. You saw Abby playing with them. And you knew what they were capable of and you didn't say anything. Yeah, maybe he should be the one threatening to shoot her. Or Actually, no, that probably wouldn't end well. <laughs> Vanessa finally comes clean about Fazbear's dark history. She reveals the ghost children are being controlled by William Afton, the owner of Fazbear's Pizzeria, who murdered them in the 80s. The cops searched the restaurant for the missing kids, but Afton was a cruel and clever man who hid the evidence away in a disturbing place. It's not just their ghosts that are inside of those machines. It's their bodies. And how does Vanessa know all this? Well, because there's one more thing to know about William Afton. He's Vanessa's father! <laughs> it's a flip of the game lore where William Afton is Mike's dad, not Vanessa's. Vanessa does appear in the ninth game as a security guard and is revealed to be a follower of Glitch Trap, a murderous mascot who's implied to be William Afton's ghost? God so basically damn it, the, the guy that created all the animatrons and everything, he's really like a crazy like carnival type nigga. Like, you know what I mean? Like a lore in these amusement games. park. Knew up front, they like, wouldn't be able to cover crazy everything shit. in the film. The lure is massive, and there was no way we were ever going to fit everything into one film, nor was it the intention. Sure. But she and Cawthon both agreed that Afton would be crucial to include, and made sure to tie the film to the story of the first game. As a final blow, Mike recognizes Garrett's toy in a photo, and realizes William Afton is the man who kidnapped his brother long ago. Oh, it's personal now. Vanessa's too scared of her dad to help Mike, but arms him with a bunch of tasers, since they'll mess with the animatronic circuitry. Mike takes her cruiser back to Freddy's, where he diehards his way inside. He disables Freddy and Bonnie with a bucket of water and a well-placed taser shot. Chica, however, is absent. She's leading Abby to the back, where a mechanical makeover awaits her. Mike arrives just in time to save her, but their escape is hampered by that pesky cupcake. Mike shocks his foe into submission, giving Abby a chance to ball Pocalypse Now into a hiding spot. When Mike tries to find her, he runs into a yellow bunny, the boating figure all over Fazbear's wall of drawings and the 8-bit opening credits. Mike tries to use his taser, but this ain't no robot. This is William Afton in the flesh, or rather, in the suit, a yellow variant of Bonnie known in the games as Spring Bonnie. Abby's being found by Foxy until he's put down by a deuce ex copina. It's Vanessa who's decided to come help out after all, but they'd better hurry since Afton wastes no time disarming Mike and kicking the absolute shit out of him. You could just leave it alone, could you? <laughs> Afton reveals he murdered Garrett shortly after kidnapping him, so I'll go ahead and put him on the count. The kid killer Damn. is positively thrilled he gets to complete the That's set seven. by murdering Mike right now. Symmetry, my friend! He summons forth Fazbear and friends to finish off Mike, but Vanessa shows up and holds her father at gunpoint. Between his voice and that ghost face knife wipe, you might have guessed Afton's identity before he removes his mask. But if you didn't, surprise, Sydney, it's Steve Raglan. A reveal that might have been more shocking if Lillard wasn't announced as William Afton back when he was cast. Also, wait, what the fuck? I thought he was supposed to be purple or something. <laughs> anyway, major props to Lillard for his physical performance here, considering he couldn't actually see out of his suit, instead relying on Tammy's direction to know what he was doing. Vanessa gets a shot off on her old man before he regains the upper hand. Abby tends to Mike, who realizes her drawings might be able to save them, since they're how she can communicate with the ghost kid robots. He tells her to show them what really happened. Giddy up, Abby. It's doodle or die. Afton tries to stifle her art, but he stopped by Vanessa, who receives a gnarly stab to the stomach for her troubles. Abby pins up her drawing, which depicts Afton's crimes against the kids. It strikes a chord with the animatronics, and after Mike puts a spotlight on the kitty killer, the band finally turns on their manager. He tries to get them back under his control with some sweet talk. You are wretched, one little beast! But for some reason, it doesn't work. Mr. Cupcake takes a bite out of him, which causes the suit spring locks to activate. And a scene rips straight mm. from the games. Afton is crushed inside his suit as he defiantly puts his mask back on. I always Always come back. I know that line comes from the games, but I wonder if Cawthon knew it was already a Chucky quote. I always come back! Mike and Abby escape Chucky with an injured crazy. Vanessa as the restaurant begins to collapse, leaving Afton to be dragged away to an unpleasant fate. In the film's epilogue, Abby is shown to be thriving, while Vanessa is shown to be in a coma. Womp womp. Over dinner, Mike and Abby tease a sequel by talking about visiting the animatronics again. The film fades back to a ruined Fazbear's, where Golden Freddy's ghost child stands watch over a seriously messed up Afton. He's not quite ready to go on the count yet, though. If you're familiar with the game lore, you know why. The end credits are scored by the Living Tombstone's 
Five Nights at Freddy's song, another early viral creation well, that helped pop- we're gonna end it off there because that's how many people died in the video. So we literally just got the whole history of Five Nights at Freddy's, which again, this guy said at the beginning of the video that if you are somebody new to it in general, like like it's it's very like confusing overall. So now understanding the origin of everything and watching this made me even understand it more even than just watching the movie. We're gonna leave the body count at, I think it was eight by the animatrons. We're gonna leave it at eight for the animatrons. They said there was nine people that died, but one of them wasn't by the animatrons. So, and his daughter, actually we'll do seven because when he stabbed his daughter, she was just in a coma, she didn't die. So, hey, um, Five Nights at Freddy's history. Let me know what you guys think about this in the comment section down below. And uh, I know you guys are big Five Nights at Freddy's fans. So again, this caught my attention. I thought I might want to react to it for y'all. Before I get up out of here, if you guys like to follow me on my gaming channel, link will be in the description down below. I've been posting consistent content over there. You guys have been showing major support. I truly appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Love y'all. See you guys in the next one, baby. We are out. Peace.